there can be a healing process through true crime, not just a healing process, but also a sense of community. And for women who have a lot of anxiety, I, I, I think these, these stories can make you feel like you can prep for disaster. That's not always true. You can't, but certainly the more you know, the more you can protect yourself. Welcome to Tapping Creativity, a podcast for the creative community. Yes, it's a podcast for you. Whether you're looking for insight, inspiration, or community, you found yourself in the right place. My name is Matthew Temple. I am the host. And on this podcast, we go into questions, inspirations, challenges of the creative process. It's about connecting with other artists, hearing what other people are struggling with, their wins, their challenges. If you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe, follow, share. If you really like what you hear, give us a thumbs up or give us some kind of review. And with that, let's hop into this week's episode. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Tapping Creativity. And today we've, we're taking a fun, unique, different angle into these questions of creativity and how it gets applied. Our guest today is Kim Daly, who writes about pop culture and true crime and mystery when she's not working as a copy editor at Workman Publishing, who happens to have published her new book. She holds a master's degree in trauma studies and previously worked as a rape crisis counselor. She lives right now across from the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. And welcome, Kim. Hi, Matthew. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So before we get going, in your bio, you mention uh, that you live across from the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. That's obviously means something to you since there's only so many words that go into a bio. So why that in there? So it's just a fun fact. I think in a bio, usually where the author lives is included. So I decided to just spice it up a little bit. It's also, you know, it's not unrelated to my interest in true crime, I think. I think not everyone would take an apartment overlooking a cemetery, but I was happy to do it, to do so. And the cemetery is also, it's really beautiful. It's very, very beautiful and historic. And it, yeah, it does make sense. That's kind of what I was wondering because your uh, the new book is The True Crime File and living across from a cemetery uh, is somewhat apropos, I suppose. But I'm curious, so you're a writer, you studied English there. And as a writer, there's kind of anything and everything uh, that one could write about or you sort of put their energy and attention into. And you have chosen, at least here in this particular book, true crime. So why these topics, as it were? I've always been fascinated with true crime. Uh, it's always, I think a lot of true crime fans have sort of one crime that they can point to that really got them into true crime. And I've always envied that because I do not have that. I just, it's always been part of my consciousness. I remember as a child reading about uh, the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and the Menendez murders and even Amy Fisher, Tanya Harding. So that was in the early nineties. And, and then a few years back, uh, I started seeing these sort of re-examinations of those, of those cases, and they were just so different than how I remember them being portrayed in the media, certainly, but also the way my parents talked about them. And I thought that was so, so interesting. So I, I guess I just kind of wanted to do that in, on a really large scale. And you kind of talk about that a little bit in the book as some of this sort of evolution of like even how we approach this particular mm -hmm. topic. And right, there's sort of like once you begin to dig deeper, there tends to be a little bit more than what makes really great headlines. Absolutely. And the stories don't need to be sensationalized. They are interesting, naturally. They're naturally interesting. Um, and a lot of a lot of crimes, they don't it doesn't just happen out of nowhere. It's not random. There are there's more behind it. Is there sort of like just an interest? Is there like a pleasure in this topic or is it connected to some part of your larger purpose through what you studied in some of your earlier work? There's a, yeah, I have a huge interest in the topic. I, I wouldn't say that I take pleasure in most, most of it is, is pretty dark. Um, I, I mean, I, I have dark interests and that's okay. A lot of people, a lot of people do. And I am able to use 
basically the full extent of my degree, certainly in English, um, and I focused on trauma studies in my grad work. So that helps me make these stories trauma informed, which is which is important if we're doing a if I'm doing a, a reimagining or or not a reimagining but a, a retelling and from a different angle. And my background as a victim advocate, certainly, I would I I want these stories to be focused on victims and survivors and less so on the de the gory details of of what these criminals did. Right. So, you know, so then in that case, is there something that is like uh, cathartic or healing for you and or, or sort of a healing sort of more broadly, perhaps for victims or even our culture at large in dealing with how we deal with crime and the trauma that causes crime and then the trauma that is a result of crime. I do think victims of violent crime, there can be a healing process through true crime, um, not just a healing process, but also a sense of community. And for women who have a lot of anxiety, I, I, I think these, these stories can make you feel like you can prep for disaster. That's not always true, you can't, but certainly the more you know, the more you can protect yourself. Okay, so, there, so there's almost a sense then, almost uh, you're saying sort of an obligation as a writer with this interest to share this in that way of sort of bringing sort of that a small amount of control in a large world that is so chaotic. Yeah, I think I think that I think my obligation as a as a writer uh, would be more to to approach these topics with sensitivity and respect, that, um, because so often they're they're not and they haven't they haven't been. Right. So you know, one of the things that interests me is that you know you went obviously what you you studied English uh, writing is obviously in your DNA. You your day job is in the publishing writing field as well as your clearly nights and weekends job. How do you relate sort of that, the creative work that you do and your inspiration? You know, it's like a lot of times I find people kind of look inward, you know, it's like, well, novelists certainly do, right? Like I've got to come up with this world and there's still, but there's still a relationship between a novelist and what you're doing. And there's this, you, you actually have to bring yourself to it. And I'm just kind of curious about your creative process and how you sort of apply your creativity in in this in this particular genre right so the baseline again is absolutely you know trauma-informed writing and, and victim focused writing so I, I'm coming at it from that angle always and then it's other than that it's just nonfiction writing is just tons and tons and tons of research and, and sources right and then uh, as for the writing itself I, I, I also envy writers who can get do a lot of drafts, do a lot of drafting, so they can sort of just like empty everything in their head onto the page, and then and then just fine tune it and fine tune it. I don't I don't do that. I I agonize over every word and sentence. I think that's I think that's the editor in me, you know, the copy chief, copy editor in me is just agonizing over is this the right word? Is this exactly the right word? So um, it's, it's pretty painstaking once it gets down to you know having the page in front of me. I can I can only imagine. I think that you know there's uh, some research that actually shows that the left brain and the right brain uh, don't work very well at exactly the same time. So if you're in editor mode while you're trying to be in sort of in right brain creative mode, you're basically like the two hemispheres of your brain are at war while you're trying to just simply write a book. <laughs> yeah, that explains a lot. I really appreciate you putting it that way because I <laughs> never thought of that before. But absolutely, it is it is hard to leave the editor behind. Interesting. So I want to go back. You said sort of trauma informed or do you say uh, victim centered writing? Is mm -hmm. that the word? so though you've, you've you've said that twice. So tell me about that. Is that like what does that mean? Is that a term that I should have known before today? I don't think so. I mean, it's it's uh, I know that I, I mean, I've heard the term before, but for me personally, I can't say that this is the, the broader definition. It means that when I'm when I, trauma informed would be when I'm approaching these stories, I'm not approaching them as like a, you know, an, a, I mean, none of them are fun. <laughs> like they're really the darker crimes are obviously not fun, but it's it's not just like a salacious kind of. 
uh, clickbaity interest story. It's it's it comes from trauma and pain, and I want to be sensitive to that, and I want to make sure that I explore that in the writing. And then victim focused, I think I I, I mentioned. Uh, I, I don't. I want to focus more on the victims and survivors and less on the the, the gory details of of like what a serial killer did. Like n- like not so much on methodology, more on impact and outcome. Because that actually is what has the potential then to have an impact in the world, right? Because we we are all in some ways or another. I think you can tell me what you think about this, but we're all some ways products of trauma. Right, because if you're lucky, you'll you go back, you know, two generations to get pretty serious trauma. But most of us don't actually have to even go back that far. It's either first person or you know our immediate our immediate families, and there. So because of that, like that healing of how do we actually transform that trauma into something that you know does actually help us? Because as we know, there's a nice saying that if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. But that's definitely not always the case. It can become the case, but it's not inherently the case that your trauma is going to make you stronger just because you're still alive. Absolutely. And I think working through working through personal trauma with true crime, a lot of it is about raising awareness uh, for these crimes. And then an- another, or the effects of the crimes, not the crimes themselves, but um, another thing about... Uh, Another thing that goes into being victim focused is is uh, taking the blame off of the victim, because that's that was another part of the sort of those sensational stories uh, uh, in the '90s and 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 before, or even in the aughts, maybe up until last year. I don't know. There probably there are probably a lot of there are probably a lot of uh, tr- there's probably a lot of true crime media that still says you, you know oh they were hitchhiking or 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 whatever you know there's no there's no thing that you could be doing to deserve a lot of the, these horrible things that happen. And, and, and it's, it's because of this like abnormal psychology of, of, of dangerous people, of dangerous violent criminals. And there's not enough focus on that. Um, and there's too much focus on what could the victim have done differently. That's what I think. So I would like to swap that as much mm, as possible. I like that. I think that's really important. So tell me a little bit about your about your process as a writer. You mentioned a little bit your painstaking every single word, um, and in a three hundred and something page book, that just sounds like you're trying to create your own painful trauma story, <laughs> right within the process of writing. Um, but no, but a little bit broader. Tell me about sort of how you come to it and what you know, because at some point you had nothing on the page. You had an idea, but you didn't have. And you didn't have a manuscript, and then eventually you went all the way from I have an idea to now I have a book, and we're getting to talk here today. And by the time this thing goes to air, we'll be able to go and purchase a copy of your book. That's a, a lot of stuff happens between that initial idea and where we are today. So I'd love just to kind of focus, we'll kind of maybe break it up into a few steps, but that first part of going from I have an idea to, you know, I what is the things that I do in order to then actually have a, a draft of my manuscript? Right. So a lot of that has to do with, for me, and in this particular case, has to do with being on both sides of the publishing process. So Workman publishes page a day calendars. So it started with that. It started with a true crime page a day calendar. So I started writing that in 2018. And then in 2019, uh, we had a, a new editor, not so new. He had worked at Workman, I think, in the '90s, and he came back. And in between, uh, in between his two Workman stints, he he became this pro true crime editor and built a true crime list from scratch. John Miles is the same, and he saw this calendar and he was like, "This is great potential for a book. Like, you know, it's it's popular, and uh, there are all these sort of short, snappy." true crime stories that we can expand on and my you know there was an interest in my perspective on true crime the less salacious uh perspective and and uh sort of more more conscious telling of the stories so that's sort of how it morphed into a book (laughs) so it started it started with this format which i love i love page a day calendars um and 
then it morphed into this idea for a book. And then I was sort of along because I'm on, because I'm usually on the other side of the process. I'm not usually, I'm not usually the author. I was sort of along for the ride after that, honestly, because I was just, I love bookmaking. I love the whole, the whole process of bookmaking from, and now, I mean, now it's cool because I've been, I've been involved in all of it. Like I, I was there for the drafting, obviously, like for the writing, for the research. Um, and then, you know, the whole thing to actually like being in the warehouse and, and making the book, um, I've seen it done. I've never done it myself, but I've seen it done. And, and the whole process is, is just amazing. So it was great to, to work with my colleagues who I work with every day in, a, in another capacity and just really see them do, do their thing. Yeah. Um, so I did, I, I, I was probably a very easy author with them. I, <laughs> because easy for you to say. I want, yeah, yeah, because I wanted to be. Um, I really wanted to work collaboratively with everyone. It was my opportunity to do that, and I and I took it. Nice. I love that. Um, I was talking to my daughter today about this idea of how uh, a lot of times you think if I want to do something, I want to get something out of it, and that just even the way we say that is I'm out of it as opposed to I'm in it particularly as artists and creatives, like to really get something done, you kind of have to be in it, right? Like being out of it creates this sort of, it, it's obviously just a little bit of a word play, but you are usually probably a little bit sort of like on the outside, you're help, you know, you've got, you get to be the critic, you get to be the, you know, that other, the less vulnerable part. And now here you are bringing your manuscript where there's a little bit more vulnerability. What was that like going from that place where you're a little more outside editor to bringing your creation? I think that it helped me really understand where authors are coming from, obviously. Like, it, these, are, I, I always had this idea that, I always had this understanding with authors that they, they just put so much of themselves into their projects. And then they have to, as you're saying, they have to, they have to hand it off and, and it, it does create a lot of vulnerability and there can be sort of clashes along, along the way. And I was interested to see where that came up for me and where I was able to sort of just go with it. And, uh, it was just, it was a very interesting, it's my first book and it was a, it was a really interesting process. And I, and I do wonder, I mean, I want to write another one right away because, because I wonder if I would do it the same way the second time around. All right. Well, you'll have, you'll have to keep me posted on that, on how it goes the second time around. Um, <laughs> So, you know, you work at, at Workman, which I'm, I'm actually a big fan of, of the work that you guys do there. What is some sort of insight that you have for other sort of writers, whether they've been published before or whether, you know, they, maybe they've been self-published or kind of trying to get that first manuscript out in the world? What's some insight that you have both from your work as an editor on the publishing side, as well as now having gone through it on the writer's side? So I can't say that I know that much about acquisitions because I don't, I don't, I don't have anything really to do with that. But what I would say, um, I'm a, a copy chief and a production editor, so I'm I'm doing the the after the developmental edit before the book actually goes to production um, to to be manufactured. Um, I would say that as an author, once you your man, after your manuscript submitted, once it's acquired, to definitely try to have a, a strong sense of what type of author you want to be because it will make like everyone's on your side as an author everyone wants the book to be the best book um, but what an editor or a copy editor even thinks is the best might be different from what an author thinks is the best so you kind of have to assert how much how how, how collaborative you want to be in the beginning um, and then that will just make the whole process a lot, a lot smoother if everyone, if everyone kind of knows what you want as an author, what you want out of, out of the publishing process. It, I, obviously it's going through, going through a publishing house is super different, completely different from self-publishing. So, um, there are a lot of steps and you kind of have to anticipate what, what you want out of each step. So maybe also ask for a little guide of what's gonna ha what's gonna happen because I think I think when when uh, it's very exciting when a book gets acquired but uh, especially first time authors might not totally know exactly what's gonna happen it goes through a lot of a lot a lot of steps and it passes through a lot of hands and a lot of eyes. 
So uh, I'm going to go back one uh, just briefly before we end here. You you end your book, or it's pretty much at the end, on a uh, um, on a little factoid that I find particularly interesting, and I have been kind of I've been I've known this for a long time and wonder why it gets so little attention. And you put it at the end of your book, which tells me that it matters to you too. I'm just going to read this little piece here. The Pew Research Center reported. That according to annual reports from the FBI, violent crimes such as rapes, robberies, and assaults decreased by 51% between 1993 and 2018. Property crimes such as burglary theft, auto theft also decreased by 54%. And then you just kind of go on to sort of, you know, all these other sort of declines. And yet the majority of Gallup surveys conducted between 93 and 2018 showed the public perception of crime rates clashes with the data. That was obviously an important enough factoid that it came right at, that's like the button on the book. Um, Tell me a little bit about that and your relationship to that particular information. The sort of joke, I mean, I hate to call it a joke, but the sort of wink wink of that fact being at the end of the book is that you just read a book with more than 200 crime stories. And like, I wonder why public perception is that crime is up. (laughs) <laughs> and, it, and it is. It is because uh, true crime is so prevalent in the media now, right? It used to be just the, the newspaper, the 10 o'clock news, 2020. And now you can you can stream, you can watch docuseries, you can stream podcasts while you're in the shower if you want. I don't recommend it, but you can do that. Um, and you can just you can just consume true crime all day, all day long. And it's a good thing because it, it raises awareness, but it also raises this perception that crime is up violent crime is actually down. Although at this very moment, we are we are seeing a spike in violent crime, but it is absolutely down from the past 40 years, 30, 40 years. So it's it's an important thing to remember. It's also important, it's, it's sort of a balancing act because it is important that these crimes are being publicized because it does, it raises awareness for you know a lot of different things. Right, yeah, wow. Well, I, you know, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time today. I appreciate your insight as a writer, as someone who has, you know, who has studied this and who works in publishing, um, and also just the 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 this kind of personal relationship that you brought to something that could hit, could have been yes, yeah, salacious or could have been like why this particular topic. You actually brought something fresh to it um, in a way of well, I guess you know, as you said, sort of this trauma informed and sort of, uh, but also, um, yeah, just in this way of saying that, um, let's kind of look at this in a new way. Um, in some ways there's a compassion to it as well. Um, so I really appreciate that. And, and thank you for writing the book, for showing up and for anyone who is, is interested at this moment, uh, the book, uh, the true crime file, is available uh, now by Kim Daly. Uh, Get it wherever you get your books. And uh, Kim, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Tapping Creativity is brought to you in part by We Strive, a nonprofit organization that works to lead the world towards stronger, healthier, and more sustainable community. We Strive is currently at an exciting juncture in that coming out of the pandemic, it is in a place of looking to see how can it now, as a established organization, be of greatest support to the creative communities as well as communities who are striving in any way they know how to engage in co-creating a better world. If you're interested in learning more, visit WeStrive.org.